This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can have your voice heard regarding the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Welcome to this week's edition of Silent Voices. It's not easy talking about oneself when they have devoted the last 20 years to helping people fight the madness of what we call child protection services. Reverend Deaconess Honey Lee Bowman has done just that, and her fight as of June of this past year has hit the social media highway, working on the collective. She could never tell her story before now. First, she wrote her story, and now she is here with us, giving us the Cliff Notes version of her story, and if you want the full story, you can read it for yourself at her blog. Her fight leading her to the calling of Reverend was all about the collective and helping parents fight back and making a difference seeing that people as a whole have a hard time fighting the system. The system that thinks they have all the power in the world to just walk in and take the same children God has seen fit to bless our homes with. It took her 12 hours to write just the cliff notes of what happened 20 years ago and there was no way to cover everything in one sitting here today. I'd like to welcome to the show via Google Hangouts from Flint, Michigan, Honey Lee Bowman. Thank you, Dennis, and it's nice for you, of you to have me here today, and you can call me Lee. Lee, you moved from Michigan to Colorado, so can you give our audience a little background on this? Yes, in 1991, I was moving to Colorado Springs to save my children, actually, from my ex-husband who had forcibly kidnapped my three children from me. Um, we were moving out there to take, I was moving out there to get my children back from him. Um, I had left him and was told that possession is nine-tenths of the law here in Michigan. And CPS, neither CPS or the state police would get involved. And I was told that to get custody, I had to have physical custody. Now, I should have known in the beginning of my ex-husband's satanic behavior beforehand when he started having me participate in extracurricular activities during sexual escapades. My youngest son at the time, who was a month old at that time, uh, no, I take that back, he was two to three months old at that time, um, belonged to another man conceived out of one of those escapades. And after going to that father, I proceeded to leave him and go with this husband, uh, this, the father of this man and try to start a new life for my children. Well, in the meantime of leaving this man, or my ex-husband, he, my ex-husband found us before we could leave the town. And 
his family found us and proceeded to do a three-way block with a barricade on the other side of the vehicle. He held no consideration for the infant, no consideration for his own children that were in the vehicle and threatened to harm all three children, myself and everyone in the vehicle. And if I didn't relinquish the children at the time, holding my children's best interest in mind, I relinquished the children and left, hoping that someone would help me from a higher authority later on down the road. I left my children behind. A week later, I get a phone call from him. Not even a week later. Telling me to meet with him. I, uh, I, I agreed. I says, look, okay, fine. I want to see my children. Bring my children to the meeting. He agreed he was going to bring in the children. And when he showed up, he only had one child with him my youngest child. He did not bring my other two children. He only brought one. And that is when he informed me he was leaving the next day from Michigan to move to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Fearing for my children, that was a life sentence, life death sentence for me. Without a word to anyone else, I left the state of Michigan to be with my children. I left the next morning. You're getting ready to leave Colorado and move back to Michigan. Your child got sick and you took your child to the hospital. What was the results of that visit? I, I had been fighting for a while to get back to Michigan after I finally got my children away from their father. After leaving a safe house and ended up in staying with a friend. He was in school. He had been at school all day long. And my son ended up running a high, high fever from tonsillitis. And I couldn't get it down all day long. I tried Tylenol. I tried rubbing alcohol baths, all the home remedies. And they made it home. And I looked at him and I told him, look, I've tried everything. I need your keys. I need a map to the nearest hospital. I need you to watch the other two children. And I need it now. He said, fine, here, go. I get to the hospital. I look at my son. I says, you look. And mind you, he's like a year and a half at this point, too. I says, baby, it's okay. We're at the hospital. They're going to take care of you now. They're going to help. At this point, I have all the utmost faith in the system. I have all the utmost faith that people are good. And they understand that the terrible twos and the climbing and all that is natural. And, and of course, discipline. And we get called back to the back, and they ask me why my son is there, and I tell them, and all of a sudden they start stripping my son down. And I'm like, wait a minute. 
He's running a fever. Yeah, I can understand that. They pull his underwear off and they start inspecting every inch of my child. And they find a small fingerprint, faded fingerprint bruise. And they asked me where it came from. And I was honest with them. I told them, I says, look, I swatted my son for climbing on an electric escorted out of the room. And I was met in the hallway by a Detroit CPS worker. A half hour to 45 minutes, I was met by her again, walking in the front door of the hospital, emergency room, with my children, my other two children in, in tow. And I'm looking at her and I'm asking her, what are you doing with my children? We're taking your children. You were sitting in your home. You got a knock on the door, looked outside. The caseworker and the police were outside there. Something had happened to your youngest child. I opened the door and without taking me inside at all, they look at me and they tell me my child is dead. No warning, no nothing. They just look at me and say my son is dead. I collapse right there. And that's the last time I ever seen my son was at the hospital. After all these events, did you get your children back? I got my children back when they put me on a plane to send me back to Michigan to bury my son. So after that, you moved back to Michigan with the children. And then you had some more problems with the CPS. Yes, we we moved back to I moved back to Michigan in around Mother's Day when <clears throat> I was feeling I was grieving my son and I was feeling all alone and my mother and my grandparents were never around. I had witnessed my mother and grandmother arguing about my children and I being there. I felt it necessary to leave and be somewhere where I had freedom, my children had freedom, regardless of what kind of freedom that was. And several years later, when I was pregnant with my last child, CPS was called on me again for neglect, abuse, and I was the one that was reported. There was 13 people living in the home, and everybody in the home lost their children. However, within days, they had their children returned, except for me. I did not have my children returned. I fought for four years, not three, to have my children returned. CPS would return them, take them, return them, take them. I was charged with failure to protect, abuse, neglect. In the meantime, my ex was approached and asked to terminate his rights in lieu of prosecution because our five-year-old daughter had accused him of sexual molestation along with my six-year-old son. 
Now, I want to stop right there, Lee. Uh, when I heard this part of the story, it just had me fuming. Um, your ex, and let's put his picture up here so our audience knows who he is and to look out for him. Uh, he molested your daughter and then goes out less than a year later and molested a 13-year-old girl. Now, CPS allowed him to terminate his rights for no charges to be filed and lets him run loose to commit this crime on another 13-year-old child. And, and that's a you know, shame on the state of Michigan. He's sitting in prison now, but this would have never happened to that other child. I have his recent confession. His recent confession to his sister in black and white. In his own words, stating he did this. The state of Michigan is refusing to take me off a of central registry. I was not the abuser. I never committed these crimes against my children. I was never the heinous criminal that they are accusing me of. I was never charged with any crime. In the state of Michigan, there is a recent law that has passed where if you have been on central registry for 10 years or more, you can file for your name to be removed from central registry. I have filed. Nine times out of 10, your name is not going to be removed from central registry. The reason they gave me for central registry denial is because my central registry, I terminated my rights on four children. I have five children. Not four. Five, not four. Now they did charge you with. Uh, now they did charge you with failure to protect. Um, can you explain to us the one parent doctrine? I sure can. The one parent doctrine law is derived from the Nancy Schaefer Act because Nancy Schaefer um, deemed it unconstitutional. And Nancy Schaefer was a legislator in the Supreme Court or legislator in Georgia. Um, on June 2nd, 2014, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled in, uh, in R.E. Sanders the opinion that application of the one parent doctrine impermissible infringes on the fundamental rights of unadjudicated parents without providing adequate process and deemed the doctrine unconstitutional under the due process clause of the 14th amendment the one parent doctrine allowed the court to obtain ju jurisdiction over a child based on the adjudication of one parent yet enter dispositional orders regarding both parents the Opinion expresses that due process requires a specific adjudication of a parent's unfitness before the state can infringe on the parent's constitutionally protected one 
constitutionally protected parent-child relationship. Now to explain that. One, 495 Michigan, 394, 2014. Two, because the one parent doctrine derived from NRE CR 2250 Michigan AP 185 to 2002 allows the parent to deprive a, allows the court to deprive a parent of the fundamental right to direct the care, custody, and control of his or her ch children without any finding that he or she is unfit. It is unconstitutional. It is an unconstitutional violation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. In R.E. Sanders, 495 Michigan, 394, 422, 2014, overruling in RECR 250 Michigan APP 185 2002 dispositional hearings are constitutionally inadequate. Due process requires that every parent receive an, adju an adjudicational hearing before the state can interfere with his or her parental rights. Now what that means is that every parent, if they're married, not married, partnership, or whatever, whatever one parent does, both parents are judged as one. It's an unconstitutional hearing. For example, me, take, take my case for instance. I was judged based on what my ex-husband did. He was the pedophile, so I got judged based on what he did. He violated my children, so I got charged accordingly. I got charged with failure to protect, neglect, and abuse. I didn't get charged with being a pedophile because I didn't do that. I got charged with the lesser charges, but I was never criminally charged because they couldn't prove it. Failure to protect is a lame excuse for charging someone when they can't prove the allegations. Now, now you were reunited with four of the five children. Can you tell me how... That has gone. The state does no justice when it comes to adoption or foster care. When it comes to reunification with the children after they've been adopted or in foster care, they totally psychologically manifest this disregard of parents they don't want you they never wanted you they dropped you on the doorstep and they totally alienate parents my children were told that i never wanted them that i didn't care that i was a drug addict that i was an alcoholic that i beat them profusely that i was an evil monster which is farthest from the truth. I never did a drug a day in my life. I was never an alcoholic a day in my life. I have so many psychological barriers that I have to overcome with my children. It isn't funny. But the one thing that I really want to touch base on right now is the fact that Nancy Schaefer coined a good phrase when it comes to dealing with parents of the poor when she wrote her article in 2007 of November 16th the corrupt business of child protective services 
She writes, I have come to the conclusion that the poor parents oftentimes are targeted to lose their children because they do not have the wherewithal to hire lawyers to fight the system. Being poor does not mean you are not a good parent or that you do not love your child or that you, your child should be removed and placed with strangers. That all parents are capable of making mistakes and that making a mistake does not mean your child, children are always to be removed from the home. Even if the home is not perfect, it is a home. And that where a child is the safest and where he or she wants to be with family. That parenting classes, anger management classes, counseling referrals, therapy classes, and on and on are demanding of parents with no compassion by the system even while they are at work or while the children are separated from them. This can take months and even years. It is emotionally devastating both children and parents. Parents are victimized by the system that makes a profit for holding children longer and bonuses for not returning children. That caseworkers and social workers are oftentimes guilty of fraud. <clears throat> they withhold evidence. They are they fabricate evidence and they seek to terminate par parental rights. For when chain charges are made against them and charges are ignored, that the separation of families is growing as a business because local governments have grown accustomed to having taxpayers' dollars to balance their ever-expanding budgets, that Child Protective Services and juvenile courts can always hide behind a confidentiality clause in order to protect their decisions and keep the funds flowing. There should be open records and court watchers. Look who is being paid. Well, I'm certainly sorry for what the state has put you through, uh, you and your children. And I want to thank you for coming on the show, Lee. Thanks for having me, Dennis. If you'd like to be a guest on this program, you can contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. And I want to thank all of you viewers out there watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make a, a difference. difference.